Hello everyone. In this presentation, we are going to learn something interesting and informative about another heavy metal. It is one of the best studied toxic substances and as a result, the adverse health effects of this metal are more known than virtually any other chemical. The health problems caused by this metal have been well documented over a wide range of exposure on every continent. The advancement in technology have made it possible to research its exposure down to very low levels, approaching the limits of detection. Introducing to you now the heavy metal called lead. Lead is a normal constituent of the Earth's crust with trace amounts found naturally in soil, plants and water. If left undisturbed, lead is practically immobile. However, once mined and transformed into man-made products which are dispersed throughout the environment, lead becomes highly toxic. Solely as a result of man's action, lead has become the most widely scattered toxic metal in the world. Unfortunately for people, lead has a long environmental persistence and never loses its toxic potential if ingested. It is believed that mankind had used lead for over 6,000 years. Lead mining probably predated the Bronze or Iron Ages with the earliest recorded lead mine in Turkey about 6,500 BC. The oldest artifact of smelted lead is a necklace found in the ancient city site in Anatolia. The estimated age of this necklace is around 6,000 to 8,000 years. There were many reasons for lead's use other than its abundance and ease in obtaining it. Some of the properties which would make it commercially attractive include easy workability, low melting point, ability to form carbon metal compounds, it holds pigments well, it's very easily recyclable, stands up well to the outside weather elements, high degree of corrosion resistance, and it is inexpensive. There are also several habits and customs of cultures that contributed to human exposure, exposure such as using lead in medicines and cosmetics. Lead is a heavy, soft and steel gray metal. Several of its salts occur as variously colored powders or liquids and are used widely in industry and at home, producing cumulative toxicity on chronic exposure. Lead acetate has been used in therapeutics, Lead carbonate is still being used in paints. Lead oxide is essential for glazing of pottery and enamel ware. Lead tetroxide, which is red in color, is used in sindur. And lead sulfide, which is, is used as an eyeliner or surma. Tetraethide lead, or the organic form of lead, was previously mixed with petrol as an anti knock to prevent detonation in internal combustion engines. However, it is banned now and we have unleaded petrol. Now let's look at the history of lead toxicity. The Romans conducted lead mining on a massive scale and had several huge lead mine and smelter sites. Lead was in big demand and was a byproduct of refining silver and gold ore. One smelter site located in Spain required tens of thousands of slaves to operate. Another large site was in Greece and the emission from these two sites would rise high into the atmosphere and get picked up by the world's air currents. In ancient, in ancient Rome, Lead poisoning was a disease of the wealthy who used lead extensively. They used lead cooking utensils and pots and even lead wine urns. The word plumbing is derived from plumbum, the Latin for lead. 
Lead is naturally sweet in taste and is found to enhance both the color and taste of wine. The Romans used sapa, a boiled down concentrate of grape juice. The problem with sapa was that the kettle used in boiling unfermented grape juice into a concentrate was made of lead, which leached into the liquid because of the high acidic content of the grape juice. The Roman women are known to have used a lot of lead-based makeup. There are many distinguished historians who now believe that this high exposure to lead was a contributing force in the decline of the Roman Empire. This picture was drawn by my friend Dr. Bertha to depict the fall of the Roman Empire. Salts of lead are used in the manufacture of various products which are there upon the screen. Now we'll discuss the mode of action of lead poisoning. It combines with sulfidal enzymes and it inactivates them. It has an effect on the CNS, the CVS, the renal and the reproductive system. Coming to CNS, it produces decreased nerve conduction, increased psychomotor activity, behavioral learning disorders and even lowers IQ. There are various studies which have been conducted and which have proved that as the lead lead levels in, in, in children increase, the IQ levels decrease. In the CVS, it is known to produce hypertension and myocarditis. It and the renal, it produces nephritis. And the reproductive system, it is supposed to produce infertility. Lead is known to decrease heme synthesis and it also increases hemolysis. A major focus is on the enzyme systems of heme synthesis because several of the enzymes are very sensitive to early exposure to small quantities of lead. The most sensitive are ALAD and ferrochelates. And these enzymes and their accumulated substrates are widely used as screening tests for lead exposure. Erythrocyte ALAD is strongly inhibited by lead and as a result, ALA rises in the plasma and is excreted in the urine. Measurement of ALA is difficult and the results lack sensitivity for low level lead exposure. Therefore, instead of its substrate ALA, erythrocyte ALAD is more commonly assayed. Copropofirin also rises in plasma and is excreted in urine. And like ALA, it is also difficult to measure and lack sensitivity. Hence, this method is not used as an index of lead poisoning. Ferrochelates is a second major enzyme that is strongly inhibited by lead and as a result, protopopyrin accumulates in the erythrocytes and causes an increase in zinc protopopyrin levels. The final diagnosis of lead poisoning ultimately rests on the measurement of blood lead concentration and this is best done using flame atomic absorption spectrophotometry. The normal blood lead levels of in adults and in children are there on the screen. For adults, it is, should be less than 10 micrograms per deciliter and for children less than 5 micrograms per deciliter. Now let's look at the toxicokinetics of lead poisoning. Lead is absorbed through all portals of entry. Occupational exposure results mainly from inhalation, while in most other, situ most other situations, the mode of intake is ingestion. Tetraethyl lead, however, can be absorbed rapidly through intact skin. Lead is drawn to, into those areas of the skeleton which are growing most rapidly. These include the radius, the tibia and the femur, which are the most metabolically active. The hypermineralization is reflected in the form of densities, which are the classic lead lines observed on X-ray, because lead is stored in the bone as phosphate and carbonate. And these lines are called as lead lines.
acute poisoning is rare and it manifests as the symptoms which are projected here. Chronic poisoning is also called as plumbism or satanism, common quest, a common question which is usually asked in examination. I will now tell you the symptoms, signs and symptoms of chronic poisoning in a manner which, which is easy to remember using a mnemonic. The first one is facial pallor. Now this facial pallor is characteristic feature of chronic lead poisoning and is due to vasospasm, though anemia may contribute to a significant extent. Next one is anemia. The anemia, however, occurs late in chronic lead poisoning and it's not and it is not specific nature because it is of less diagnostic importance than it is usually attributed to it. The peripheral smear, smear may be hypochromic and microcytic. Basophilic stippling is often seen. Next is lead line, which I mentioned earlier. The hypermineralization is reflected in the form of densities, which are classic lead lines, and they can be observed on X-ray. You can see the picture here. Another line which I would like to bring to your notice is Burton's line. It is a bluish black line on the gums due to deposition of lead sulfide. The next point to remember in chronic lead poisoning is lead palsy, which is foot drop. It could be foot drop and wrist drop. Then coming over to reproductive changes. Earlier we had mentioned there are cases where infertility has been related to lead poisoning. So also stillbirths are also related to lead poisoning. Cardiovascular manifestations, I had mentioned this earlier in the form of hypertension and myocarditis, colic and constipation. Lead colic is an intermittent severe abdominal cramps. There may be tenderness, tenderness around the umbilicus. In fact, the Greek philosopher Nicander of Colophon in 250 BC reported on the colic and anemia resulting from lead poisoning. Encephalopathy, you can see mental retardation, cerebral palsy, optic neuropathy, hyperkinesis, and periodic convulsions. And there are other changes like fatigue, myalgia, weight loss. Well, to remember chronic lead poisoning, you can remember it with the word fall rock, F-A-L-L-R-O-C-C-E. Well, this is another picture from my friend, Dr. Bertha, where it talks about Mr. Plum Talks and the manifestations of chronic lead poisoning or plumbism. You can appreciate the encephalopathy, the lead line, the colic, the wrist drop, the foot drop, the dialysis, and also the hypertension. Coming to the treatment of lead poisoning, thymine is supposed to be of use for neurological manifestations calcium gluconate IV for lead colic, chelation, BAL, EDTA, and DMSA. DMSA can be given orally and it's known to be more beneficial as compared to the other chelating agents. Now we will discuss the medical legal importance of lead. The most sizable chunk of plumbism occurs from occupational exposure among workers exposed to lead such as battery workers, painters, miners, plastic manufacturers, garage workers, etc. Today, chronic poisoning is said to be the most important environmental health problem, particularly among child children. Children are especially vulnerable or susceptible to lead poisoning because of the increased absorption of lead from the GIT when compared with the adult. The child with pica is in is an enhanced danger because of the tendency in such a case to lick lead-based paint off walls, furniture, toys, pencils, etc. Lead poisoning is almost always accidental. Instances of suicide or homicide with lead-based compounds are extremely rare. Today we discuss that lead is a naturally occurring toxic metal found in the Earth's crust. Its widespread use has resulted in extensive environmental contamination, human exposure, 
and significant public health problem in many parts of the world. I hope the presentation was useful and you're able to remember most of it. Thank you. Stay safe.